Good evening. Welcome everyone. Please, if you can take your seats. There's a little space here in the front. Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all here this beautiful uh, evening, beautiful fall evening. Minnesota. My name is Alejandro Valle and I'm the director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies here at the University. And uh, it is a distinct honor uh, to welcome to the Twin Cities artist Daniel Blaufuchs and to kick off the series of events with him that we've organized this week together with our partners and friends. And I would like to uh, take the opportunity to, and start uh, by uh, mentioning and thanking all our co-sponsors who have made this event possible. It's a long list, so you have to be patient. Uh, Center for Austrian Studies, Center for Jewish Studies, Center for German and European Studies, Department of Art, Department of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature, Department of English, Department of German, Scandinavian and Dutch, Department of History, Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Institute for Advanced Studies, McAllister College, Rimon, the Minnesota Jewish Art Council and initiative of the Minneapolis Jewish Federation, and of course, the Weizmann Art Museum. A special thank you to Jennifer Hammer, the Center for Holocaust Genocide Studies Program Associate, who has brilliantly coordinated all the moving pieces of this program, and also to Demetrius Vital, our new outreach coordinator at the center. I would like to start with a quote from George Steiner from a very uh, from important text that is often quoted. It is not the literal past that rules us. It is images of the past. This is the subject, this is the subject which brings us here today and which has been one of the constant interrogations in the work of Daniel Blaufuchs, the use of film and photography to create memories, even memories that are actually fictional. What role does photography, film and art play in the preservation but also the construction of memory? Memories are images from images from images, writes Daniel Blaufuchs. I would like to thank our panelists for being here today and for engaging in this important subject. Gary Cohen, Paula Rabinowitz, Alice Lovejoy, David Harris, and the panel will be moderated by Leslie Morris, who is Associate Professor in the Department of German, Scandinavian and Dutch. And there could be no, no one more suited to do this, to moderate and to contribute to this panel. She has written extensively on the poetics of memory, on the notion of post-memory on contemporary Jewish-German writing and on art after Auschwitz. We're very lucky to have Leslie Morris as an extraordinary involved affiliate faculty member at the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And before I turn over the microphone to Leslie, let me add a big thank you, because she has been an integral and a driving force of this program, and Daniel is today here with us in Minnesota, thanks to Leslie's energy, enthusiasm, and hard work together with us at the center. So, uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Leslie. Again, welcome, Daniel. And uh, I very much look forward to, to a fruitful discussion and conversation on this fascinating film. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro, and uh, I also want to first thank Alejandro for graciously agreeing to my um, request that we bring Daniel Blaufuchs um, through the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. I'm also particularly indebted to Jennifer Hammer, who has worked tirelessly and tended to every detail of this visit. So it's really an enormous pleasure to have Daniel Blaufuchs here with us today. He is a remarkably prolific artist who has worked at the intersections between photography and literature, between cinema and philosophy 
from a very early project he did in 1991 with the writer Paul Bowles, My Tangier, to the Terezine book in which he draws on a single image in W.G. Zabald's novel Austerlitz, to the video project that is the topic of tonight's event. Um, I'm not going to list his many books, installations, and awards because they are too numerous and they're really quite dizzying in a Zabald-like manner. But I will mention a few things. His work has been shown widely and to great critical acclaim. The award-winning documentary, Under Strange Skies, an exploration on the topic of Jewish refugees in Portugal during World War II, was shown at Lincoln Center, among others, and has continued to gather a lot, to garner a lot of attention and interest from historians working on this question of the refugees in Portugal. Um, he has had exhibitions in Lisbon, Siena, Rio de Janeiro, New York, Madrid, and now Minneapolis. And I'm also pleased to say, initially, when we had this idea to bring the film here and to bring Daniel, um, the uh, NYU will be screening the film, and they were going to do it first, but plans changed, so I'm happy to say this is the U.S. premiere of Aus Op, and New York comes second after Minneapolis. So that's also uh, a, nice, a nice added touch. Um, his photography has also won numerous prizes, and um, the book Terezine, which in some sense is, we can think of as part one of this project, and I think that's a question that will surface um, in the discussion as well. This is the book that first brought me to Daniel because um, he, as I mentioned, takes an image in Zebald's novel Austerlitz that he traces. The earlier trace of this is in the monumental work on Theresienstadt by H.G. Adler. And it was through this that I discovered Dan, um, Daniel's work, and I feel as if I'm continued, continuing to discover it um, as I move through the various projects. The video project that is the focus of tonight's event was part of a large installation at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Lisbon, All the Memory of the World, Part One, that I had the great fortune to see when Daniel had invited me to Lisbon to speak last year. Both the video and the entire exhibition from the museum are epic in size and, at the same time, microscopic in focus, bringing together a remarkable array of texts, literary and visual, and this is Daniel's standard trademark. He works very much in the traces of Zebald, of Georges Perec and uh, Borges as well all of which are part of Daniel's ongoing meditation on the connections between time and space, between public and private memory. In the selection of essays and interviews with Daniel Blaufuchs entitled Works on Memory, Daniel Blaufuchs states that he is not interested in the single photographic image, but rather, and I'm quoting from him, in the sequence or flux of images in a kind of cinematic prose. By simultaneously breaking and creating the frame of reference by the sequence of photos, Blaufuchs's project also depends on the relationships or constellations that he creates among images. He is, as he writes in another essay in the museum catalog of All the Memory of the World, part one, interested in working with, and I'm quoting, the labyrinth of images as part of the chain of transmission between generations. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion tonight, to hearing the responses of the four panelists, and to a lively discussion with all of you. So before um, I introduce Daniel, um, and he will speak just very, very briefly, and then uh, the order will be the same order as in the program, and I'm going to just introduce our speakers right now. The first speaker will be Gary Cohen, historian of modern and central Euro uh, Eastern Europe, whose work focuses on the history of social relations and minority-majority relations in the Czech lands and Austria. Our second speaker will be Alice Lovejoy, assistant professor in the Department of Comparative Literature and Cultural Studies. Um, she is a film historian whose work and her research has focused on Czech documentaries. Third will be Paula Rabinowitz, professor in the Department of English, who is a noted film scholar and whose work also explores issues of popular culture, gender, class, and the documentary. 
And our final speaker will be David Harris, the Executive Director of Rimon, the Jewish Arts Council, which is an initiative of the Minneapolis Jewish Federation, and he is also an artist and a musician in his own right. So uh, that will be the order. I'm going to invite Daniel just to say a word or two, and then we'll turn it over to the panelists, followed by Daniel. Thank you. I just say briefly, thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you for being here. And um, I'll, I'll say also, uh, due, I think due to my jet lag, uh, the projection, I don't know if you noticed, was in a, a bit of a wrong format. Uh, I only noticed it 10 minutes into the, into the film, but I didn't want to interrupt. And I, I don't, but on Friday it will be shown in, in its right uh, format. You notice that in Terezin the cars are not as stretched and the people are not <laughs> uh, as. Uh, uh, and I just wanted to, to, to say that what we saw was just the, the beginning of this uh, long, uh, long work of more than four and a half hours uh, on Terezin and. Um, and when, when we decided to obviously only to show an excerpt uh, here, I decided that, that it should be uh, just uh, we should start from the beginning instead of choosing uh, parts or you know going to the middle or showing showing uh, more towards the end. So you'll get you, I think you got the idea how we get more and more into into the town of uh, of Terezin. and the rest I leave now for the. Thank you. So, uh, well, thank you, uh, Leslie. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, we saw the first half hour of the film uh, proper, as, as Mr. Blaufox has just mentioned, and we begin uh, on a bus ride out in the Bohemian, central Bohemian countryside, uh, and that's a clue uh, to an important clue to the fact that uh, Terezin, the Czech name for the town, uh, is removed uh, from any larger city. It's, it's about an hour's drive north of Prague, uh, near the confluence of the Elba and uh, Oja or Eger rivers. Uh, the German name for the town uh, is Theresienstadt. It was named in honor of Emperor Joseph II's mother, Mar Empress Maria Theresia. Joseph II ordered the construction uh, uh, of a large fortress there, uh, and one of two large fortresses in northern Bohemia, uh, to guard against uh, possible invasion or incursions by Prussia on uh, the late 18th century, after Austria had had two uh, significant wars and had been defeated by Prussia twice. Uh, in Terezin, there are in fact two fortresses. The large fortress with the, the big uh, battlements, bastions in the style of, of the French military engineer Vauban, uh, in the shape for the large fortress of a 12-pointed star. The town itself is completely enclosed uh, by those ramparts and bastions. There's a smaller fortress separated by a branch of the Elba River uh, that's come down to what's called simply the small fortress, uh, which was part of the defenses of the city. The town developed uh, as a fortress and garrison town from the 1780s when it was built all the way uh, to World War I and after. Uh, there were army troops stationed there. Uh, they lived in 11 barracks. There was a civilian population that developed as well. Uh, but it was never more than maybe 3,000 people. A town with only 3,000 civilians, uh, totally fortified, uh, and it remained under special military rule until the 1890s, uh, was very attractive for various security purposes. The Habsburg government, the Austrian government in the 19th century, uh, uh, took what had started out as a military brig, a uh, stockade and a small fortress for um, army miscreants and began to put uh, other prisoners there, political prisoners, other criminals uh, were imprisoned in the small fortress. In World War I, uh, 
people suspected of treason, uh, and sympathy to Russia, other prisoners uh, were kept there. They, the assassin of Archduke Francis Ferdinand, Gabriel Princip, was kept uh, in uh, Terezin uh, for at least part of, of the war. After World War I, the Czechoslovak government, uh, proclaiming that it was going to create a new, fresh, open democracy, continue to use Terezin uh, as, as a uh, military garrison town, although there was, of course, a civilian population there as well. So there's a certain logic uh, to the Nazis having chosen to use Terezin as a transit camp, a ghetto uh, for the Jews of Bohemia, Moravia, Austria, some from Germany, some from as far away as the Netherlands and Denmark. There was a logic given its location, its fortifications, its closeness to the Elbe River, uh, also within a couple kilometers of the main train line from Prague going north to Dzechin, Dresden, uh, and on to Berlin or Hamburg. Uh, it was an attractive spot, a logical place uh, to use for security purposes uh, to create this ghetto. They uh, uh, began to move Jews from Prague there in late 1941. They cleared the Czech civilian population out of the town in the first months of 1942. They began to use the small fortress, as was mentioned already, uh, already for political prisoners uh, uh, in 1940. Remember that the German occupation uh, of uh, central Bohemia and Moravia began in 1939, March 1939, before World War II broke out. So the Nazis had a good deal of time uh, to decide uh, uh, how they were going to administer these territories even before the war began. Uh, and they were well positioned once they decided to initiate the mass extermination of European Jews uh, to take advantage of this location uh, for uh, purposes of creating a ghetto uh, and a transit camp. Eventually, more than 140,000 Jews from the Czech lands, Germany, Austria, some from the Netherlands, Denmark, other European countries, were brought there. More than 80,000 uh, were sent to their deaths uh, at other uh, extermination camps. Over 30,000, and I've got the number somewhere, uh, between 33 and 38,000 died in Terezin uh, of disease, malnutrition, uh, overwork. There were also some executions of Jews there, as well as executions of political prisoners uh, in the small fortress. Today, the memories are there for anyone who goes to visit. For the people who live there, they still live uh, in the architectural remains of what was built as a fortress town. They live off the tourism of people coming to what is now a monument uh, to the Jewish ghetto there. It was logical for the Nazis to put the ghetto there to use this fortress. I hesitate to say natural, very little was done there that was natural, but it was logical. For the people who live there, for the people who go there, it is as if the whole history is present. Whether it's alive in the everyday consciousness uh, of the various constituencies is a question we can discuss. <clears throat> There's many as ifs in the film. Okay, uh, and very deliberately the film shifts uh, realities uh, from the contemporary to the documentary photos and film footage uh, to the dramatic representations uh, in two different uh, Hollywood miniseries, uh, Holocaust and War and Remembrance. It is as if all of those things are part of the living, developing, changing memory of the town. But there are many as ifs. And if I get a chance to have a discussion, maybe we can coax out of Mr. Blaufuchs just how many as ifs uh, he was thinking about, or he's heard people in the audiences tell him they have it.
fascinating, uh, moving, and multi-layered piece. And I want to talk about these layers to begin with. So of course we have the layers of history that Gary's just talked about, but we also have the layers of film itself, from the miniseries, Holocaust, etc., to Alfred Raddock's famous 1949 Czech film, The Distant Journey, which is uh, some of the footage you see in white, um, to perhaps most notoriously, The Fear Gives the Jews a City, which was a 1944 film. Um, so we have the 1944 film, um, The Fuhrer Gives the Jews a City, which was a um, pseudo documentary that was shot in Tennessee itself. Um, so I'm going to talk some, uh, for the most part, at the beginning of this talk about um, The Fuhrer Gives the Jews a City, which is a film that's come to occupy a very important place in the history and the mythology of Tennessee. Um, but it was in fact one of three films that was made in Tennessee between 1942 and 1945. All of these three films were SS projects that were made by Czechs under duress. Most of the filmmakers and the participants in the films were prisoners. Um, the first was a short documentary entitled Terezian Shot in 1942, which was directed by a Czech prisoner named Irena Dodalova. Um, now Dodalova was, at this point, a well-known animator working in Prague with her husband, Karl Dodal. Um, together they founded the animation studio IR Films, IRE Films, um, which made advertising films, short films, etc. Now, in a biographical twist that's particularly um, fitting for where we are today, Dodalova's husband had actually managed to escape Czechoslovakia at the start of the war. Um, he moved to the United States, and in January 1940, he and his fellow Czech emigre Otto Radl found themselves here on this campus at the University of Minnesota, where they were teaching a course on animation, or film animation as a means of education. Um, and this was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, which had sent Radl and Nobel um, to the university to work with visual education services, which I think was around uh, relatively <laughs> recently, uh, BES. Uh, so they were working with them on this course on animated film. Now, Irena Dodalova had tried to escape Czechoslovakia, had tried to get out to join her husband, um, but was unable to, and she was uh, later deported to terrorism. So, um, an interesting uh, intersection there. Now, Dodalova survived the war, um, and she gave testimony later about her work on the film, on, on the documentary. Um, but the film itself did not survive, although Dodalova managed to hide some of the shots from the editing room that was constructed um, in Terezin, and she later sent them out with prisoners on a transport um, to Switzerland in 1945, which is how some of those fragments ended up in the film. Um, so that's uh, one of those histories. Um, the second film was another newsreel. This one, made in 1944 by the Czech newsreel company Aktualita, which had existed before the war, um, but uh, continued to exist during the war um, in the protectorate. Um, and the Aktualita workers who ended up working on this film were apparently threatened with deportation if they didn't participate. Um, so on the commission of the Central Office for the Settlement of the Jewish Question in Bohemia and Moravia, they went into Terezin in charge of making um, a newsreel about the city. Now this, uh, too, did not survive, although one of the filmmakers um, who went on to have a long career in Czechoslovak documentary also smuggled out some shots, some stills, um, and uh, he and others from Aktualita ended up working later that year on the most famous, most infamous film to come out of Terezin, um, which is The Fear of Gives the Jews a City. Um, now, in fact, it seems that that was not the final title of the film. It seems that the final title of the film was Terezin, a documentary film from the Jewish settlement area, even though you see on the clapper boards the fear of the Jews of the city. So there's some uh, question there about what was a working title and what was a final title. Um, this film also did not survive, although it survived um, in much longer fragments than the other films, um, several minute long fragments, and these are the fragments that end up in your film as well. Um, so the history is well known of this film, but I'll, I'll recap some of it here, um, as it's important not only for what's going on in, in El Sol, but also for um, the history of Czechoslovakia's cultural elite in Terezin, because Terezin was a site where many uh, members of the Czechoslovak avant-garde, Czechoslovakia's theatrical, artistic communities, um, ended up during the war. 
Um, now, the film was made for the Red Cross visit to Terezin that took place on June 23rd, 1944. It was a visit that was only six hours long, and I think that's a really striking um, thing to remember. It was, it was pure theater. Um, the beautification campaign to create the Potemkin village of Terezin um, that we see in that clip from, I think it's Holocaust or Holocaust, um, that took place from late 1943 through summer 1944, so quite a long time for a six hour visit. Prisoners acted in the film, um, which was again made with the crew from Aktualita, but it was directed by a prisoner named uh, Kurt Gerben, who was a very famous Czech-German actor and director, um, again, prisoner in Terezin. By September 1944, the film was edited, but by October 1944, most of the prisoners who had worked on it had been deported from Terezin eastwards, including Gerben. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tragic story. Um, now there's another part of this, this film, um, The Fear of Gives a Jew is a City, that I want to talk about um, at the end here, which is the text that we see in the top right hand corner of the, of the footage from this film, which says, stage Nazi film. Um, and these are words that you see in almost every copy of the film that you can find, um, and, and in my research on this that I've been able to find. And they underscore a broader dynamic surrounding this film in its post-war and its archival afterlife. Um, because this is a film that's always being bracketed, it's always being framed, it's always being explained. Um, and this is in part because it only exists in fragments, right? We don't, we don't have the whole film, so you need something to make it, um, make it into a narrative. But um, it's something that's existed uh, from the very beginning of uh, The Fear of Gives the Jews a City's Afterlife in Czech documentary. Um, the first film uh, that uses fragments from the film is, I believe, Vladimir Kressel's 1965 film, um, the Gift of the City, or Miesto Darovane, um, which is the only documentary that's actually shown in Terezin. They, they claim that they're showing the uh, Fear of Gives the City, but in fact they show this 1965 film. Um, the fragments were discovered in 1964, so they make their way into this film at a moment when the Holocaust is coming back into cultural discourse in Czechoslovakia in the 1960s. But we also see this kind of bracketing of the film at work in um, a recent exhibition on filming in Terezin that was put on by the Jewish Museum in Prague, where the film is always surrounded by historical documents, by testimonies, by diaries, by photographs, etc. Um, so there are a lot of things that we might take away from this idea of bracketing. Right? On the one hand, um, that the viewer can't be trusted to uh, know what's true and what's false, um, to decipher what the stage document means. But on the other hand, there's this idea that the film fragments as objects are somehow too powerful to be left alone, right? That they need somehow to be contained or um, constrained. Um, and I think this highlights a broader dynamic between um, historical truth and staging of various kinds that we see in this film um, and in films about terrorism in general. Um, and this is highlighted in the, in the fragment that we saw tonight. Um, first, of course, we have the question of how fictional strategies, like the ones we see in um, Holocaust attempt to give a sense of the lived experience of Terezin during the war. Um, and here I find the use of sound in this fragment almost the most destabilizing, right? Because there's American accents and that, that overwhelming uh, musical score is, is jarring. But alongside this, um, and I think quite brilliantly in this film, we have Intercut the Distant Journey, um, which was famously reviewed in 1952 um, by French critic André Bazin who described the distant journey as an example of what he saw as an expressionist thread in Czech cinema. Um, and this is something that you can see in the clips and also very clearly. Um, plastic use of the image, low-key lighting, um, choice of actors, etc. that is quite expressionist. But what's most interesting about Bazin's comments on um, the distant journey is that he also claims that this is a realist film precisely because of this expressionism. Um, and I'll end with a quote from Bazin. He writes, what is shocking is that here, the most questionable characteristics of expressionism paradoxically find a profound justification, a realist virginity. All the paraphernalia of this artifice that, it, that one had thought to be peripheral imposes itself as the most logical and the most necessary result of a nightmare reality. No doubt involuntarily, but through an internal and in a sense metaphysical fidelity to the universe of the concentration camp ghetto, the film finds the world of Kafka, and more curiously, of Saad. Um, so I think this notion that staging uh, can actually be the most truthful evocation of the nightmare reality of Terezin 
um, echoes the complexity of the questions that we see in also, which is bracketing everything. Right? It's not just bracketing the fear of these views of city, it's bracketing these fictional films, and also Lafox's own um, wonderful footage, whose uh, stillness and duration asks us to take the time to consider this. into my little piece called Still There, um, which I have to say, unlike the rest of my esteemed colleagues, I didn't type up. Um, and I want to thank again uh, Leslie and uh, Danny Lovex for this beautiful, profound, and very uncanny piece, because if you watch the whole uh, four and a half hours, as I did last night, again, it's not much before, um, uh, you see that there is uh, a narrative going on in what appears at first to be a highly, highly formalist film. So I'm going to begin with two, uh, there's many, many rich things to talk about um, that have just been touched upon. But I, I, and I'm going to be talking, you know, really as a film, you know, as a film critic we have here. Um, but I want to, you know, there are many, many ways that I could go into this. But I have two questions and then I'm going to make some comments in, by way of kind of not really answering them, but opening up other things. The first one is at what point in history do fiction and propaganda actually become documents? In other words, the, those various films that uh, Ellis was just talking about are now serving as the repositories of memory and therefore of history. And they have, in an uncanny way, in, uh, in um, Daniel Ruff's film, a kind of authenticity that the very static, gorgeous shots that he does in real time uh, destabilize and undo. So there's a weird relationship between what is happening and what is made up. And then the second one, which is related to that, is how do you represent history and memory through form? Because this is a highly <coughs> formalist film. And um, we saw in, uh, in the opening shots some of the ways in which form works, and I want to talk about a few of them. Number one is the whole question of the still, and the way in which we are asked as viewers to hold still, and to look closely, and to feel time. And in that sense of being forced to feel time, we are, um, Feel that this is an homage, this film is somehow a multiple homage, um, and we're pushing it to another level of Claude Lanzmann's Shoah, of Jean, uh, uh, of, uh, not Jean Dielman's film, uh, Chantal Ackerman, um, may she rest in peace, um, uh, film Jean Dielman, and, um, and it's a kind of counter argument, uh, as so many films are, to Ellen and his night and fog, in the sense that. We have to look and we have to be still, and we are still there. In other words, Terzen, which was there from the 18th century, is still there. So there's something about the remnant and then the objects, and we saw the little last segment in which, the, um, the, towards the end when we were watching, the objects that are um, in the vitrines with, if you look carefully, the reflection of the filmmaker in the class. Uh -oh. That is tied up to these levels of interpolated films, of which I think there are six on top of Blaufuck's photography. Um, but I'm not sure. Are there six that are interpolated? Or you're not going to tell us something. <laughs> <laughs> I counted six. <laughs> um, uh, and in those, uh, towards the end, um, include the documents of Eichmann's trial in Israel, um, and uh, so we've got this weird relationship between what has historically been understood as documentary, often seen in black and white, which of which two of the films that we see in black and white are f f fictional films, and color, which is almost always since Hollywood invented it, you know, you know, made it popular in 1939, is associated with fantasy. That's the moment when Dorothy sees Oz. Um, so we've got this kind of weird reversal in which um, fiction and documentary and black and white and color are working together. Um, the whole question of 
the living space and the dead space of Terrazan is constantly being brought up by both the juxtapositions, again, which we saw of the stage scenes in the stage Nazi film, and then the actual, um, you know, I guess what, what it was called, bunkers or whatever, uh, the ramparts that of the, um, what are the bastions. Thank you, bastions. Um, uh, so what's living and what's dead, what's staged and what's real, and then, of course, for all of the moments when he sets up this very, very still camera, um, the various people who live there are walking by and biking by and driving by. We hear the ambient sound of them speaking. So there's this kind of sense of sort of still and deadness, uh, dead, stillness, deadness, but also liveness. Um, the, uh, as I said, the, and, and Alice mentioned as well, the question of duration and the long take, and they get longer and longer the takes as the film goes on so that while there is this narrative, because in some ways it's a story of the four or five years of Teresa as, um, as a Jewish ghetto and, um, and ultimately death camp, um, uh, although not officially, um, the, uh, so we're sort of going towards an end. Uh, we're also uh, in the middle of a, a kind of um, endless, endless progression. And the film finally is extremely, extremely uh, full of, you know, Blake's fierce symmetry. We begin on the road in the rain. If you watch the four and a half hours, which we do on Thursday, you see that we are leaving on a train in the rain. Um, there are more and more intense investigations of two uh, competing or, you know, or actually interrelated um, letters, the letter V and the letter W. Um, and we are, there are many, many, many shots. We saw one of them right after, um, I think, the boy in the garbage, uh, of a uh, Renaissance perspective with a very, very you know, long point of view. They get longer and longer and longer as the film goes on so that you are, in a sense, history is receding, and that is my whole question about the formalism of how do you represent time and the inaccessibility of the past through form, in part, ironically, in the Renaissance perspective. But at the same time, and we saw also a number of these, um, and again, we get closer and closer to these, we are juxtaposed with the rusticated coins of these buildings, and they are jutting into us, so that if history is receding on the one hand, it's also really moving into us. And again, as the film goes on, the, the corners, get closer, the uh, long perspective gets further away. And finally, there are these amazing triptych um, uh, horizontal shots of which again we saw, we sort of ended on one of the, of the, uh, with the signage of the, um, the grocery store the, uh, market and the windows, but there are over and over again of the doorways of the, of, of the entranceway to the fort, of the, door, of the doors and windows of of the apartment buildings and so forth. So there's a kind of, um, you know, dialogue going on in the film between looking at something that is flat and in and this triptal, you know, tri triptic form, uh, and looking at something that's in the distance and looking at something that is coming close to us. And these are all, in a way, violations of um, the sort of thresholds between the camera and the space, and therefore between us and the um, uh, and the, the subject of the place. Um, just to kind of close up, uh, there are a number of other things going on. Obviously, lots of them. Um, first of all, is the um, whole presence of the surveillance cameras, which again become more and more and more obvious in the present day Terezin, and then you start realizing that the whole question and the cameras that we saw actually. This the whole question of the camera and, and surveillance is, is key there. Um, the, uh, the multiple palimpsests that are operating, uh, which again we saw a little a, a moment of that with the leftover address on the wall, and then um, the uh, uh, later on you'll see more and more of them are painted over. So there's a kind of uh, you know, endless proliferation of rusting metals of. Um, peeling paint 
of crumbling stucco, of these overwritten signs, and then, of course, these um, sounds which are bleeding uh, across the different images. Um, and uh, um, I guess I'll stay there. <laughs> As a musician, I gave much of my attention to listening to the film Als Op, to silences which in fact were not silent, to a profusion of dim, ordinary sounds, life occurring, which were actually manipulated to unify and bridge scenes in the film. The chirping of radios, car engines, a church bell, birdsong, voices passing in and out of earshot. To what end was this music of ordinary life, this musique concrète, used? First of all, the presentation of understated mundane sound and the lack of a conventional narrative cultivate an internal imaginary space for the viewer. We hear ourselves think our subjectivity is in the front of our mind. We are forced to make a decision about what we are seeing, to evaluate it, rather than taking emotional dictation from a force-fed storyline. For much of the four hours and 40 minutes of Als Hop, the film is barely inhabited. We are left alone with Terezin and our own decisions about what we are seeing. So how does the filmmaker's underscoring work? How does it support his desire to instigate questioning and ambiguity rather than to provide answers and definitive statements? In the course of the film, we receive a little primer in how underscoring in a film can work. A snare drum, evokes an ominous atmosphere heavy with portent. How manipulated we feel by that. Storytelling of that kind feels heavy-handed, leaving us no space to think. Blaufuchs stitches together a more subtle aural fabric. The shots of doorways and windows, which Paula referred to, which hang motionless in front of us, are almost like a still life. But the sounds which accompany them are continually changing in their infinitesimal sound progressions, undermining any sense of timelessness. Contemporaneous sounds bleed into train noise from an earlier film which sets up a scene from the staged historical film a bouncing basketball from today is superimposed on an audience's applause in a fictitious film for a staged musical performance. The present moves backward into the past. We can't encounter Terezin without our imagination searching for an earlier version of the village. And the past moves forward a funeral procession's music overlaps uncannily with a mundane present scene. The past will not leave us alone. It's not unlike the repeated visual trope of broken barbed wire, which alludes to both the original wire and its sadistic function, and to the passage of time and the wires, or is it our memories? erosion, musical transitions that bleed from Nazi propaganda film into the present and then back again, rub our nose into untidy, overflowing reality of a town ghetto named Terezin or Theresienstadt. The near emptiness of present-day Terezin provokes the need to tell a story. But what is the story? We need to populate the space with its past, but what is its past? The pre-recorded instructional narratives 
join the other oral devices that we hear, such as the sentimental string music from the featured films, as one more set of prompts that tell us how to think, how to feel. Ironically, the history of Terezin we hear is told by no one in particular, by a disembodied voice. But the tour guide voices become synonymous with explanations, coherences. We begin to question those voices as well. In the film we are, wa we are watching, uh, and is the film we are watching lacking the, the artifice of the films which Blaufuchs quotes? Or does the obvious artifice of the other films instruct us on how to see artifice in every construction, including Als Ope? The occasional subtle d dissociation of sound from its accompanying image announces to the viewer, this is not unmanaged footage. Is this simply another version of reality we are viewing? Perhaps the soundtrack for Als Op is about resonance, an echo chamber of illusions and images. Everything belongs in this quietly resounding landscape, past, present, fictitious, and didactic voices. There are even small, perhaps witty, perhaps sarcastic, dollops of Baimir Bistouchain and Konidre, two of the more overused tropes of Jewish music. Also inclines us to distrust the constructed memories of the Nazis' fictitious film and the subsequent commercial Holocaust dramas. <coughs> Reflexively, how will this film installation, this construction, appear to the next generation in 25 years? The film ends with the squeak of the train's wheels, the three-part train whistle, carrying the viewer, the listener, to a conclusion. The task had been set in the film's opening minutes. The road is continuous, but seeing it is not. Well, I'd like, I'd like to thank all four panelists for wonderful comments on, from the history of um, Theresienstadt to the film, con the film history that is embedded in Daniel Blaufuchs's film, to Paula and David's comments um, on the film itself. And I'd like to now invite Daniel Blaufuchs to speak briefly, and then I think we can open it up for a conversation. Thank you. Well, what can I say after <laughs> these wonderful uh, speeches? Thank you so much. Um, I would like a, a, a typed copy of each text. <laughs> um, so I don't know exactly what I should add to that, but uh, maybe uh, I'd like to to say there is another layer uh, that goes uh, unmentioned, uh, which is uh, obviously Zebald, uh, W. G. Zebald's book Austerlitz, uh, that brought me to to make the first project in. Uh, in, in, in Terezin, and uh, which is the book uh, that I published in, in 2010, although it is a project from 2006. And, and, and actually the, the reflection that Paula mentions that I'm reflected in the, in the shop windows goes back to Austerlitz because in, in Austerlitz he has um, a photograph of exactly that, that shop that used to be an antique shop. And, and, we cut it actually at that point. We can still see the below the new letters. It still says uh, Antiques Bazaar. And strangely enough, in that uh, photograph in Austerlitz um, of the shop window, we see the reflection not of the character Austerlitz, but of Zebold, the the writer, which is an, an incredible thing because it takes us out of a fiction book into a reality of uh, of the writer. So when I, when I filmed um, 
the windows. I, I, at, at the beginning, I was not intending to, but I noticed we had a problem with the uh, with the reflection, and I was the film is was uh, shot uh, in a week uh, with uh, with Katerina Morão, who is a documentary filmmaker and a very good friend. And we went both to Terezinha and did the film. Um, uh, both we were both doing camera and and sound. And she uh, and she said, "Well, I have the right filter for that." And I said, "No, no, let's, this is good. Let's not use uh, the filter." So there is this Zebalt layer that also is in the in the doors uh, and, and and gates because he also uses that uh, uh, that language, uh, the, those those photographs. And maybe I should also add uh, the the length of the film, which is rather long. Uh, uh, for enough hours, uh, um, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, it can still grow because I see it as a work in progress. Uh, recently, there is a new film I heard about, uh, was just shown in Germany, a fiction film based on Austerlitz, and I'm sure they filmed it in, uh, they filmed also parts in, in Terezin, so it, who knows, it can be, it can be eventually in, in included. But, but when I started editing the film, I understood that uh, Terezin is so, so is small enough to be uh, all included in, in one watchable film, meaning if I would show uh, a larger city, I would never have the pretension to show the whole city. If I would try to do a film on, 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 on Minneapolis, New York or, or Lisbon, I would not make you sit for the, probably the two months that it would be necessary to show, to show these cities. But Terezin is small enough that I understood that it can be contained in, in, uh, in, in a few hours. Uh, so, so that's one of, re of the reasons for, for the film. The film usually is shown in, a, in an exhibition context, in a loop, although it only loops once a day. Um, but you can go out and in whenever you want, so, so it has that, uh, that uh, advantage. And also, um, like you mentioned, the, 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 the Red Cross visit, uh, you, you mentioned six hours, I read uh, between four and six hours, so I kind of, I'm trying, maybe someday the film will be this six hours, this idea that, you, that they could do a report in, in six hours about this, this town. And, and in this way, uh, all, the, all the, the streets of Terezin and almost all the buildings are in the film, are contained in my, in my film. So if you do stay the four and a half hours, you not only you get an idea of the of the city as it is now and how it uh, it was then, but you also get the feeling not comparable, but you get the feeling of being trapped into into the city that you are always seeing the the wall at the end of, of the streets and, and, and so forth. So this and in the in, in the beginning what made me do the film and where, why I was interested, and 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 um, like I mentioned the, the stage Nazi film, which I had used for a previous uh, work that is included in that book from from 2000, the work from 2006. When I, when I when I when I got the the, the film, it, it had that stage Nazi film, and I thought first of, I mean it, it's easily uh, erased uh, or at least it can be blurred. But the word stage really interested me because it, it, it is about uh, not only the film is stage, but the whole Terrazin story is about uh, an, an, an enactment, a performance. Um, and, and it's still, in a way, a performance because this, the people who are living there, and when I thought of doing this film, I thought, how, it, how, how does it feel to live in a place that has this, this, uh, this history? And then I started thinking about Lisbon. I mean, I crossed places in Lisbon where, where there was the Inquisition and terrible things happened. And if we think about that every day, we're not, we will not be able to live, obviously. So, so I was definitely not going to Terezin and put a microphone in front of the, someone crossing the street and ask, how do you feel to live in this dreadful place? Um, because I, I would get, obviously, all of various answers, but in the end I don't think that would be very, very interesting. But I was, I was interested in how it, how it feels to be in a, in a, in a town that was 
uh, in fact, a concentration camp, although the Nazis always called it a, a ghetto, a Jewish Siedlung, uh, but it was in fact a, a concentration camp, and we saw images of the, of the post with the wire that you mentioned, and talking about globalization, these were the, the same posts that were in all concentration camps, the German made them uh, all equal for every, uh, for every concentration camp. And also, I was interested in, 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 in trying to show the, how can you show the, the whole story, all these layers, because when, when we hear, and I've never been to, to any other concentration camp, I've never been to Auschwitz, and, and, and I have lots of questions, I don't have answers about places like Auschwitz as museums, especially because what we now see in Auschwitz is just a small portion of what actually was the concentration camp in terms of size. Uh, obviously after the war most of the, of the land was taken back by its previous owners and then by the communist uh, uh, government and, and, and the barracks, the wood was used for, um, for heating uh, after the war, so most things we see are reconstructions as, as the trains and so, and, and so on and so on. And, and, and you spoke of, about the, the, the wire that we still see a little bit of it in the, in the post in Terezin, but obviously in Auschwitz the wire is new. They leave the wire a few months under the rain and under the snow, and then they put up new wire every five years. You know, it gets a vintage look, but it's not the wire from uh, 60 years ago. So all this, all this is also staged. You know, we're continuing to stage places to teach the history. If you think, if you're going to ask me if I think this is good, uh, I have no answer to that. You know, uh, I have no no clear uh, vision. I think it's necessary, um, but and again, the, that question is very, uh, very important. How is it going to be in 25 years? You know, so. So again, Terezin, in a way, it's important because it's a, a place where people live, still live, live again, and uh, through all through all this uh, this history. And, and, and just to finish the the Nazi film, which is a fake stage, uh, whatever we want to call it, documentary. It's still one of the few um, in, uh, films in real time that we have from a concentration camp. Because all the images we have in our minds from uh, from Auschwitz were not filmed while Auschwitz was uh, functioning as a concentration camp, because photography and filming was prohibited in Auschwitz. Uh, the letters were censored from the I mean uh, letters from uh, German army officers personnel. They were censored for any photographs, and they were destroyed. The Nazis knew they were doing something that should not be photographed which means that all the images that we have from the concentration camp in our head are either from the very rarely seen uh, Soviet um, films done when they liberated Auschwitz or from fiction, Hollywood, mostly Hollywood uh, material. And, and that takes us to another layer. This documentary uh, made by the Nazis is in real time, in the real place, with the real people. And, it, and still it lies more than the, the Kitsch Holocaust series. And I was very much interested in, 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 in using all of this material to confront it with each other. How can a lie be more true than, uh, than the truth uh, filmed in the, in, the, in the right place at the right, uh, right time? And, and, and just, just to finish it, in that sense I don't think this is a work about uh, the past. I think it's a work about how we read images nowadays and how we're going to read images in the future in a, in a society that uh, is based and trusts more and more images as, as its only uh, source of, of information, which I consider... Is that the sign that I take? <laughs> um, which I consider uh, very dangerous, and I, I, I think we really have to, be, have to be aware of that. Daniel, let me ask you if you care to comment. Uh, when you chose the title, how many as ifs did you have in mind? <laughs> There's so many I couldn't I couldn't count them. Because the 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 although the, this was a functioning town, but 
nobody was living there, was from there, was voluntarily there, could not leave if they wished to. So everything was, was a fiction uh, from the start. And, 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 and one thing that really, uh, we, don't, we didn't see it in this, in this half hour, but, uh, but there is a, a shot of it. One, one thing that, that, that really kind of frightening me, frightened me was to see in the, in the terrazine of today, this is completely normal because we have it everywhere, but to, to see surveillance cameras like we have in any city in the world now, but in Terezin that really gains a, 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 a completely different uh, and, and more powerful meaning. But it's, you know, it is as if it is a normal town. All right, I think we have time for just one or at most two questions, and then I invite everybody who can stay a bit longer and talk to Daniel. And again, the reminder that the film will still be here. <laughs> and screening on all day on Thursday. So if there are any comments or questions before we wrap up? As if. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we heard many reasons why it's worth watching the whole film to completely understand it. On the other hand, you said normally it's in the context of a museum and people yeah. might walk in and out and run that. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether this second form of perception also has some advantages in, in, in your view. And um, will you watch the whole film again? How often did you watch it? Or will you walk in and out at some certain points? No, I, I yeah, no, I watched it many times because I edited the film, so I spent really months in it. And when I first projected it at the museum, and the, f and the film, when it was done, it was taught for the exhibition. So I knew what was the, already the projection room. And, 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 and I was filming for a large scale. For, so I, I knew the details that would be small, would be big enough on a, on a, on a large film. The thing is, I cannot expect people in a, that go into a museum or into a gallery to see four and a half hours. But one thing that made me decide that I could do the, such a long film is, if you show any film in the gallery, uh, unless you make it like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, then people will see the whole film. If you make it half an hour, already it's going to be very difficult. So what I, what I then decided is anything over 20, 25 minutes, then I can, you know, I, I, can, I can do the film I think must, that the time, I use the time that I think it needs because if people stay or not stay, it will be, it will be different. What, what I tried to arrange, and it didn't work out because bureaucratically, uh, I come from Portugal, which has its own issues, but what I tried to do was that if you would buy a ticket to see the, the exhibition, and the exhibition was up for four months, for a month, you, you could come back, uh, and it, then you would be more prepared to spend, uh, to spend that time. Um, but I know it's hard, and, and, uh, but, but there's also a trick in the film. That if you try, you might notice there is the trick that w once you're really bored with my images, you get a bit of Holocaust series or of a, another a film, and then you get interested again because you want to know what happens with Meryl's trip. <laughs> and, and you, kind of, you kind of get, get into it uh, again. So people have watched uh, the, the whole thing. And um, and people have gone in and out, and people have, some people have have come back. I, I think the, the the liberty of the artist is corresponded by the liberty of of the viewer to decide what he wants to do. You know, like uh, with photography, uh, I always have the dream that people be half an hour in front of a photograph, like they used to do in front of a painting. But nowadays, nobody sits in front of a painting for a half an hour. So how can I expect that with a with a photograph? But with film, we have this. We have a decision. We say this film is this long, and you choose to see it or not. But unless you see it, you cannot say you saw the whole the whole uh, work. You know, you have time, and you have the chronology. There is obviously a chronology in the film as well. Up. I again like to thank Alejandro Bear and the Central Holocaust and Genocide.
Site Studies and Jennifer, and most of all, Daniel Blaufels. Thank you very much. And again, um, I urge everybody to stop in, if not to attend the whole four and a half hours, at any rate, to come on Thursday. In the morning, Daniel will be there from 10 to 11 or so. We'll do an artist's talk conversation. Um, so there'll be further chance to speak with him then. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.